I did it again. I balance my checkbook once a month. And when I check the figures in the hand calculator, everything comes out fine. Then I copy it into my checkbook. Wrong. What I need is something that will do all this busy work for me. You know, that's what people dreamed of over a century ago. A machine that they could give a problem to and the instructions on how to solve the problem. And then just sit back and wait for the answer. By the 17th century, the need for an adding machine was felt by those who labored over even the most basic accounting task. As a young man of 20, the great mathematician Blaise Pascal labored hour upon hour over simple addition while helping in his father's tax office. This is a replica of the adding machine that Pascal built. It works like the mileage indicator on your car. When you add one number to another, it carries over into the next column. The goal is not only to provide speedy and accurate answers, but also to relieve the tedium of endless hours of repetitious calculations. Well, you see, we don't spend much time today with arithmetic on a daily basis. We have some homework to do, and there's some money matters now and then. But for some people a few centuries ago, it was what they did day after day. Now, I don't mean just the few mathematical geniuses. I mean everyday people whose jobs were as boring and dreary as the most repetitious physical labor. These people literally spent their lives adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing to fill tables of numbers for use by astronomers, navigators, surveyors, engineers, and scientists. These tables were so important that governments like the French and English set up production teams of people to execute various stages of a complex calculation that would result in just one entry into a single table. In the early 1800s, an eccentric Englishman by the name of Charles Babbage convinced the English government to give him a large grant to develop a machine that would solve a certain type of complex problem. Now, while his concept for the machine was innovative, work went slowly and was never finished because in the early 1800s, the craft of metalworking was really too primitive for his concept. Now, this is the modern reconstruction right here of Babbage's early design. You can see the complex interaction of these gears. In 1833, Babbage had an exciting idea, a general purpose machine that would solve a wide range of problems. It would be a machine that, when given a package of instructions, would automatically proceed to solve the problem. And it would remember any subtotals and preliminary results needed to calculate the final answer. Well, what resulted was a design for what Babbage called his analytical engine. It'd be nice to see this reconstruction work, but Babbage intended it to be powered by a huge steam engine, and there just aren't any of those available. What we still can do, though, is point out the five components that make this so unique. In the same way modern computer cards are used, metal cards like this contained data and instructions for the steps Babbage's machine was to follow by means of a coded pattern of holes. Once an ordered number of these cards was inserted into the input section of the machine, a controlled sequence of events would happen without a human having to intervene. So the operator could just wait for the answer. This heavily geared area is what we call the arithmetic logic section of the machine, the part that would do the actual calculations. Temporary results from part of a large calculation were stored in the pattern these memory rods were placed in by action of the gears, so that the number stored in a pattern could be used by the machine later to finish the problem. And finally, the answer was directly printed out so that nobody could make a mistake while copying it from the machine. More than a century later, and these five elements are still the most important components of a modern computing system. Memory, output, input, control, and arithmetic logic. And this might be the first time you've toured a computer center this large, but I'll bet you already know which piece of equipment is which. Let's see. Here's a keyboard similar to one you might find on a typewriter. It's used for entering data or instructions into the computer. It's part of one of these component systems. Can you guess which one? Input? That's right. 
If we have a computerized payroll, the input system is the means by which we input information into the computer about how much time we've worked or who new employees are. The instructions that we gave the computer through its input system are interpreted by this unit over here that controls and sequences all the operations of these machines. It literally tells the computer what to do next, step by step, according to what you, the programmer, tell it to do. Well, I guess the word's pretty self-explanatory. The control unit actually controls what the computer does. Now, to keep that payroll system that we were talking about up to date, the computer has to do some calculations, like totaling the number of working hours or deducting taxes, fringe benefits, and so on. And that is the unit that does it. Behind these covers is the component that performs those computations. And it also performs logical operations. Well, you certainly can't tell from looking at it, but I bet you can figure out from my description that it contains the arithmetic logic component of this computer system. These computer components over here store data and instructions and hold them until we are ready to use them. Here's a magnetic tape mass storage device that's part of a component system that can store literally millions of pieces of information, such as our names, our social security numbers, the salaries, of days we were sick, and so on. Now, when the rest of the computer needs this kind of information, it'll come here to get it. This also stores the instructions that tell the computer how to process this information. Well, obviously, this is a memory component. And there are other memory devices, like these magnetic disk packs. Individual disks are placed on top of each other like a stack of records, but with space in between so that playback heads can read any part of each disk surface. Finally, we want to get our answers and results out of the machine. And we can do this by a series of peripheral devices that are all part of the computer's output system. Now, this is a hard copy printer that can spew out what we want to know very quickly. Or if we don't need it printed on paper, here's a video screen that can give us the same information. Oh, there's one more thing I'd like to add. All the components that we've talked about also have circuits located in this one big blue central processing unit that contains the arithmetic logic unit. So this one large unit contains circuits that extend out to all the other equipment we've seen. There's a lot of equipment in this room, but computing isn't so big that you can't get your hands on it. I thought I'd show you where the hardware components are in the kind of computer that you'll be using. Now, they're kind of hard to see because it's so small, but they're all here. In this area here is the arithmetic logic unit. Down in this area is the control component. Over in this area is the memory component. In this area here is the input section. And finally, over here is the output component. Now, if I turn this over, you can see the keyboard that's tied into the input section. And the video screen over here is tied into the output section of this computer that's already assembled. Now, all this machinery that we've seen is called hardware. It's the hard, physical part of computing. But this machinery can't do anything until we instruct it what to do. And it's these instructions or programs that are called software. It's the stuff that comes from our mind that tell the machine what to do. The equipment is hardware. The instructions that we give it is software. Now, I'm just about finished up typing a uh, software program that I'd like you to see. What you see on the screen here is application software. Instructions I'm giving the computer to perform a specific job, to work on a specific application that I want it to work on. I'm working out some statistics for my basketball team. I have the players' totals, but I want a list of their percentages and averages over the entire season. You can see from what I've typed in so far that I'm instructing the machine with a very special language or code that's very similar to English. 
For instance, the words print, input, and read mean to the computer exactly what they mean to us. And you can also see that these software instructions are numbered. The machine carries out each instruction according to its number. Therefore, numbering is very important. Now, of course, the machine isn't carrying out my instructions yet. It's just letting me list them on the screen until I'm ready to use them. So now I'll type in the instruction run, and we can actually run the program. What? What do you mean, what? Oh, I misspelled the word run, so the computer tells me that it couldn't understand my instruction. It's a simple language, but everything has to be precise, no misspellings. You see, inside the memory component of this machine is stored a set of instructions that does a number of things. It's called the system software. As you can see, it tells me when I make mistakes. That way, the machine just doesn't sit there when it doesn't understand what I tell it to do, and I don't sit here like a dummy wondering why it's not working. The system software enables the machine to tell me when I make a mistake. It also interprets and translates the words I type into a form the machine understands. So, the application software is the instructions that I give the machine to solve my problem, to handle my particular application. The system software interprets my instructions for the hardware and locates any faults and also generally runs and manages the system. Now, Let's correct my misspelled instruction and see what happens when I run the program. There, you see it computed and listed all the percentages I needed. And so, if I wanted to do all the other players' percentages, I could put their basic statistics into the program, too. So now you know all about the hardware components of the computer. The arithmetic logic, the control, the input, the memory, and the output. You also know about the two software components. That is, the application software, that's the instructions that you give the machine to solve your particular problem, and also the system software, those instructions already in the machine that run the system and interpret what you tell it. So the next time you get your hands on a computer, remember, these are the components that make the whole thing work for you. Thank you.